Welcome to Credo Ut Intelligum. This is Eric Ibarra. I am your host this evening. I have been asked by several people to go through a series of podcasts on a book that was written uh, some time ago, back in 1998, but it still finds a uh, common reference among a lot of inquirers who are looking into uh, Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism. The book I'm speaking of is called Two Paths, Papal Monarchy, Collegial Tradition. Rome's Claims of Papal Supremacy in the Light of Orthodox Christian Teaching by Michael Welton. Welton was a Roman Catholic by birth, and uh, he had grown up in the church, and during the Vatican II collapse had undergone a crisis of faith that he describes in the beginning of the book. The first chapter is called An Insistent Call. And I'm just going to touch a couple of things that he brings up in the beginning of his book, and then I'm going to address a couple of the things that caused him to reconsider the truth of his faith in Roman Catholicism. So he begins by speaking about the, the, the Catholic Mass, the Tridentin Mass, being changed as a result of uh, Pope Paul VI in 1969. Uh, he saw this as a, a very harmful move on the part of the Papal Magisterium and the fruits certainly uh, proved uh, his suspicion. As a Catholic myself, uh, my readers know, uh, I am no huge fan of the post-Vatican II uh, era, or collapse, you could say, I'll say it again. And I, too, share a lot of the criticisms that Welton gave here concerning the liturgy. Some of you already know that I, although I was born, I was uh, raised in the Catholic tradition, baptized and all, uh, I had lapsed into the Protestant church as I became close to being an adult, and I found myself spending time as a high church uh, patristic Anglican before coming in back into full communion with the Catholic church, and as an Anglican, our, our services were very reverent. Uh, we, we really we didn't have a, a uh, liturgical communion, Eucharistic communion with uh, the motherland of England, uh, Canterbury. But we, we did strive to make our liturgy very reverent. It was ad orientum. Uh, we followed uh, much of the pre-Reformation English style of the of the Holy Mass. So when I came back into the Catholic Church, and obviously I had just visited the closest church that I could go to, um, it was quite a shock, even coming from being Anglican. And it's a common it's a common slogan in in the Anglican Church that if if you if you're an Anglican and you know one of your Anglican uh, fellows are considering the Catholic Church, the remedy for that is just go visit a Catholic Mass. <laughs> uh, sad to say, sad to say. Uh, so, getting back to Welton, uh, I share a lot of his, his criticisms here, and, uh, and I admire his, uh, his uh, uh, willingness to reflect on uh, whether the Catholic Church is actually the true Church. Otherwise, if we don't answer these questions, or rather if we never even have these questions to begin with, um, we'll never have the answers to these questions. So, where Welton came to is a point where he had to ask himself if whether these 
uh, aberrations that were happening liturgically in the Catholic Church were just an exposition that the Catholic Church was not the true church that Christ founded. Um, and he, he he dug into that a little bit more by looking into whether the Roman Catholic Church is actually the church that has continuity with the tradition that has been handed on from the apostles to the first century Christians and from those first century Christians onward to each generation up into our time. Welton tells us in this first chapter, the insistent call, that he had recourse to many of the best historians that he could find, and uh, he came to uh, this realization that what he had assumed his many years as a Catholic was actually not quite correct. Uh, he, He knew that that both Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, uh, and I'll add here, just because of my old Anglican days, yes, even the Anglicans, uh, hold to the one church doctrine, that there is one church. Uh, the Anglicans have in a, uh, a heretical view uh, of the one church, or the one visible church, as a, as a branched off, visibility where you can have uh, one church that's existing in three or more different branches two or more different branches rather and has the equal essay of ecclesial reality so uh, but Welton was more opening his eyes to the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, he says it began with uh, his wife actually taking a course uh, by an iconographer, uh, on, uh, an icon painter, in uh, I think Vancouver. I forgot exactly where it was. Uh, anyway, so he he knew that it was either Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, which helps the readers because then we don't have to go down a list of all the other alternatives. But Welton is faced with this one visible church doctrine. Okay, a dash in between that one visible church doctrine and uh, this one visible church doctrine has to uh, maintain this continuity in order to uh, be what it is and so um, Welton looks at certain parts of Roman Catholic teaching and sees that they're out of step in his interpretation uh, as a result of his doing research into history and whatnot, he sees that the Roman Catholic teaching regarding the papacy in particular to be completely out of continuity with the early church. The first uh, issue that he brings up is that Rome in the ancient world, the Western churches alongside, and the Eastern churches, up until the end of the first millennium, were one church and shared one faith. And that one faith that they shared said, concerning the Roman primacy, that it was merely a primacy of honor. Not a primacy of authority. No, no, no a primacy of honor and this is uh, quite strong for some people and quite weak for others uh, depending on who you talk to um, it, it it can mean anything from there are certain canonical privileges or prerogatives uh, that are com- that are very conditional and can only be applied in certain contexts and even then when there's mutual uh, concord on the matter it could also mean that he just has a really uh, strong voice a moral voice that his voice or his vote rather is uh, quite important and it's and it's to be highly revered it could mean all sorts of things and I've read several books on these topics and um, 
if the readers are interested in in a, in a Catholic uh, uh, study on the term, because it, it definitely does come up in the councils, these these uh, the privileges of honor or the primacy of honor. Uh, Brian Daly has a work, and I'll link this into the the notes of the podcast, that you could look to and find what exactly did the Patristic Fathers mean by uh, honorific privilege. Well, anyhow, Welton is a very smart man, so he, he, he sees this honorific primacy, and he's looking at the Vatican Council uh, of 1870, and he's seen quite an opposition between what the Council of Vatican taught about the papal office, uh, not least the Vatican Council. We can stretch back to the Council of Lyon uh, in the 13th century or the Council of Florence in the 15th century, both of which spoke of the successor of Peter in the Roman bishopric as possessing fullness of power authoritative primacy so he comes to the conclusion based off of his historical readings that the one undivided church did not have this belief and therefore the Roman Catholics who have not only believed this successively uh, post schism but have dogmatized it uh, quite explicitly in the 19th century are carrying a defective tradition and hence would be the invalid uh, claimant to being the one true visible church. I'm going to touch a couple of things that he saw and we're going to examine the merit of that. I want to uh, step back here for a second just describe what this podcast is for and what my blog generally is. Some people who read my blog think I'm entirely anti-Eastern Orthodox or the like. That's actually not very uh, true. I'm, I'm actually good friends with some Eastern Orthodox, uh, even clergy, uh, lay people too. And uh, we can have our disagreements and uh, be very good friends. I have made Eastern studies a uh, priority for me to study mainly because when I came back into the faith into the Catholic faith from Anglicanism I had come from a deep interest in converting to the Eastern Orthodox Church I had a couple of years to to study on this and I, I made my decision to be Catholic I I went into this uh, quite extensively in my interview with uh, Brian Grant over at Athanasius Contra Mundum. Uh, it's also on YouTube on the channel Sensus Fidelium. Just type in Eric Ibarra Eastern Orthodoxy. You'll be able to listen to it there. Or at uh, Mr. Grant's website. But I, I still have that interest and uh, the schism itself has been part of me. Uh, these last uh, few years now and uh, it has drawn me to tears at times it has caused me to weep bitterly over uh, what had happened and what has been going on in the world today um, this is just such, such a tragic schism and uh, I don't I'm not driven by a lust to prove uh, the western latin doctrine <laughs> Uh, as a lot, a, a lot of people have uh, falsely uh, accused me of of, of 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 doing in the past. I'm just very interested in this topic, and uh, I think uh, I try to be as respectful and kind as as I can. Have many faults, uh, as any normal person would. Um, so I'm not here to just trash the Eastern Orthodox doctrine and I'm not here to make fun of any Eastern Orthodox people uh, I respect them, I respect Mr. Weldon here for publishing this book, I know he's got a second book also which I intend to go through called uh, The Popes and Patriarchs um, 
So this is really just to weigh the merits of what's being gleaned here by Mr. Welton and, and the Eastern Orthodox in general, but particularly from this book, uh, two ways. So the first thing that uh, Welton sees is that in the patristic commentaries, there is a division of interpretation, or rather a diverse, diversity of interpretation, regarding the, the famous Petrine text in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16, where uh, Peter, St. Peter uh, famously says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He notes that there are several fathers, probably most, if somebody wanted to do uh, an extensive survey, uh, and he actually quotes a famous survey, that the rock is Peter's faith, not, the, not Peter the human being. And so this division is, is put into... Uh, the meaning of the word rock. And Welton knows that throughout papal history, this text is quite the charter for uh, pa the papal apologetic. And so if we can, if we can get this right at the, the foundation and redefine rock, then all of uh, forthcoming papal apologetics are... Um, are going to be thrown into a, uh, a, a huge doubt because if this clearly has no relevance to uh, Saint Simon, Saint Peter the man, then uh, we've clearly the Catholics have clearly misinterpreted and invalidated our the veracity of our religion. Well, the the, fir the first thing I want to say is that. Uh, that's not the only interpretation the patristic fathers give. In fact, some of the same fathers who emphasize the faith being the rockiness of the rock um, will in other places emphatically say that Peter himself is the rock. And it is even the case that the same father who says that it's Peter's faith, it's Peter the man, will emphasize in another place that it's actually Christ who's the rock. <laughs> so we're left here with uh, a cup. I mean, a variety of options, but I think we can narrow it down. Um, you know, Roman Catholics have always emphasized that there is a multi-layered meaning here and uh, even a hierarchy of meanings. And I, I, get, this, I get this mostly from Pope, Pope St. Leo the Great, who in his sermons uh, would speak uh, very fervently on Peter's faith being the, the, the solidity that the church rests on. But he doesn't retract away from applying this to not only St. Peter the man, but the lineal succession that would go forth, even unto his own day in the city of Rome. And he also emphasized in the sermons that that solidity that he got from Christ actually comes from Christ's own solidity. And so Christ is actually the rock. So we, you have a variety of interpretation there, and it's not all necessarily dividing into three contradictory meanings. They could all flow together. Uh, I'll give you another example of some Eastern fathers who uh, exemplify this for us. One of the most famous interpreters for Orthodox readers is St. Cyril of Alexandria. In his commentary on the Gospel according to St. Matthew, which was written around 444 AD, he writes, quote, That by the words 
On this rock I shall build my church. Christ makes Peter its pastor. Literally, he places Peter over it as shepherd. And you could find that uh, if you if you know the Greek in Patrologia Greca seventy two dash four two three. Another passage and from a man who is equally revered is Saint Gregory of Nyssa in a sermon recorded in three nine five he says according to the privilege granted him by the Lord Peter is that unbreakable and most solid rock upon which the Savior built his church. Close quote. You could find that in Patrologia Greca 46-733. And for those who are listening in their car or uh, riding a bicycle or whatever, I will link this to the show notes uh, beneath. So you uh, don't worry, this will all be linked. Another place in uh, Eastern Orthodox history uh, where where this comes up quite famously is after the the post Chalcedonian collapse, when the Eastern patriarchs, uh, proving that they had feet of clay, uh, had had given in to um, the more monophysite. Christology, uh, its various forms that were existing at the time, and uh, would force them to really turn their backs on Chalcedon. Well, the Eastern patriarchs often spoke for themselves and a minority who were with them. Quite often you had some clergy, and more often monks, who would protest. In one famous protest that was sent from eastern monks they had written they had written this to pope simacus in 512 ad they write this you have not only received the power of binding but also of loosing in accordance with the example of the master those who long have been in bonds, nor only the power of uprooting and of destroying, but also that of planting and rebuilding, as Jeremiah, or rather as Jesus Christ, of whom Jeremiah was the type. You are not ignorant of this malice, you whom Peter, your blessed doctor, teaches always to shepherd, not by violence, but by an authority fully accepted, the sheep of Christ which are entrusted to you in all the habitable world. That is coming from Greek monks at the beginning of the 6th century. This also comes up in the Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century. I have here a statement that was made uh, in the t- in the the tome of St. Leo, and which was accepted uh, by the council uh, quite emphatically. In that tome it says, quote, Not undeservedly, therefore, was Peter pronounced blessed by the Lord, and derived from the original rock, that is, Christ, that solidity which belonged both to his virtue and to his name, who, through revelation from the Father, confessed the self-same to be both Son of God and the Christ. Close quote. That's coming from the Tome of St. Leo, which continued to be a document of standardized orthodoxy and was quite often put out as the condition for Catholic communion. In session three of the Council of Chalcedon, we read from one one of the papal legates who speaks out loud, quote, 
Wherefore, the most holy and blessed Leo, Archbishop of the Great and Elder Rome, through us, the Papal Legates, and through his present synod, together with the thrice blessed and all glorious Peter the Apostle, who is the rock and foundation of the Catholic Church and the foundation of the Orthodox faith, has stripped him, that is Dioscorus, of the Episcopate, and has alienated him from all heretic worthiness. Close quote. That's the Council of Chalcedon. You also have the uh, papal legate from the Council of Ephesus, which was held in 431. The papal legate there, his name was uh, Philip, made it quite clear that Peter, and not just Peter, but his successors as well, are the rock of the, uh, the church. But you'll notice that in that tome, Leo was tying together the, the substantial agent, or the principal agent, rather, of the rockiness of Peter and his successors is the faith, faith in Christ. Another instance of dogmatic value is the letter that Pope St. Agatho wrote to the Council of Constantinople, which was held in the 7th century, 681 AD. In this letter, which was heralded by the Council, just like the Greeks did the Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century, this letter made it clear that the Orthodox Church, the Catholic and Orthodox Church, had been established on the firm rock of Peter, the Prince of the Apostles. And that letter was accepted uh, with dogmatic value. Another instance where this comes up is from a bishop of Alexandria. Uh, This is uh, quite long a successor of St. Cyril. We're talking in the uh, late, late uh, seventh, or no, I'm sorry, the, the early seventh century. This is a letter written from Eulogius of Alexandria uh, to Pope Gregory the Great. Gregory describes this letter and he says, quote, Your most sweet holiness has spoken much in your letter to me about the chair of St. Peter. Prince of the Apostles, saying that he himself now sits on it in the persons of his successors. Close quote. That's a recognition of a Petrine succession right there uh, in the uh, second C of Holy Christendom. Now, let's bring this to more modern times here. And this might be a little bit of an instruction to some. It is quite a novelty to highlight this distinction of Peter's faith, Peter the man, and Christ the rock um, as the rock. Even in the present catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraph 424, we read the following, quote, Moved by grace, the Holy Spirit, and drawn by the Father, we believe in Jesus and confess, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the rock of this faith, confessed by St. Peter, Christ built his church. Now that's coming out of the, the current Catechism of the Catholic Church. You can't get more current than that in terms of uh, uh, doctrinal value here. This is what parishes all throughout the world teach. So, uh, we don't see this division or this contradiction between Peter, the man, Peter, Peter's faith is the rock, or 
or even Christ being the the sole rock underneath all of that. In fact, uh, we would emphasize that it's Peter's faith. I mean, what else would it be? What else could it be? It's not his hair. It's not his skin. It's not his muscles. It's not his intelligence. That's certainly not what's being complimented when Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. He says, Blessed are you, for you have received this from the Father as a wisdom revelation. So, if anything, what's emphasized is the receptivity of Simon the man. And what he receives is the ability to exercise this faith. In fact, in the other Petrine text of the New Testament, that text where uh, Peter is uh, told that he will um, betray the Lord three times, he says concerning uh, Peter that he would pray that his faith would fail not, and that after being converted back to strengthen the brethren. Well, what's the principal agent of strength there? It's obviously not the Peter the man, because when he's when he's in his state of weakness, there is no agent for strengthening the others. It's only after he's converted and he returns to the faith that he can strengthen the others. Therefore, the New Testament teaches us that the principal agent in Peter, and which makes him the rock, is his faith. Now, you know, going back way back to the to the New Testament documents, I think we have good enough reason to believe, just based on the text, that uh uh, P- that Peter, it's really Peter, there's something relevant to Peter himself that pertains uh, this 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 rock uh, concept. The first reason I would give is this. In the writings of the other apostles, and I'm, I'm here thinking of St. Paul, uh, in many times when he's referring to Peter, he breaks away from the Koine Greek Okay, he breaks away from the Koine Greek to refer to Peter as Cephas. Okay, now why would he break away from the the marketplace common Greek Koine to refer to the Aramaic form of saying the name Peter? which is Cephas or Kepha. I would say the most reasonable explanation is that the, the new name that was given to Simon was given in the Aramaic form. And so it had become habitual to refer to him as Kepha, even when they would transform their common tr- communication to Koine Greek. Uh, uh, so it had become so, you know, when you when you know somebody who's who's got a name that that has that uh, dialect or comes from a different language, and then you you change it over, you change your language that you're speaking, you still refer to that person with the form of the language. I could think of um, like uh, 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 like Joseph or or yeah, Joseph. Sometimes we'll say. Um, you know, uh, Jose, Jose. Oh yeah, Jose. You know, in Spanish, you're referring, you're speaking in English, but you'll still refer to Jose as Jose, not Joseph necessarily. Um, so I think that it became normal to refer to Simon as Kefa, so that even when you're you're talking in Koine uh, to 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 the Ephesians, to the Colossians, whoever you're writing to, you're going to refer to him as Kepha, the Aramaic form. And if that's the case, then we can be quite certain that Jesus, when Jesus gave him the name, it was an Aramaic. And if that's the case, like many readers and listeners will already know, if that's the case, there is no distinction between Petra and Petras in the original uh, dialogue between uh, Christ 
and Peter. The second reason I would give is the first encounter that Simon has with Peter at the beginning of the Gospel according to St. John. Chapter 1, verse 42. St. Andrew goes to his brother Simon and brings him to Jesus. And this is what we read. Andrew first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, the one that Moses wrote about. Now keep your finger there. If anybody's confessing Jesus as the anointed one here, it's Andrew. Right? He's saying that we have found the one that Moses wrote about. We'll go on. Verse 42, And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Close quote. Now, this is interesting here, because those who immediately want to to make the whole you are Peter and on this rock a, a play on words, you know, just quite simple, it's just, it's just his faith, it's that's all it is. You don't have that here in John 1. In fact, Andrew is the one making the confession, if anything. And yet, Jesus just tells him, you will be called Cephas. In, in a context where Peter is not confessing him. As the Christ. So, uh, that's the second reason uh, I would give. So, uh, I can go into many more reasons, and, and I do in my interview with uh, Ryan Grant. Uh, and the next podcast, will investigate that question a little more. Um, but I want to quote from two Eastern Orthodox on this question, uh, two Eastern Orthodox scholars, and then we're going to move on from this. The first one is from a priest. His name is... Father Laurent A. Klinawerk. He's famous for having written a pretty heavy volume. It's called His Broken Body, Understanding and Healing the Schism Between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Churches. He writes the following. At this point, I would like to present what I would consider a standard Orthodox interpretation of the passage. Father Lauren goes on. In an instrumental sense, Peter is the rock grafted by the power of God onto the divine rock in order to become the first stone of Christ's edifice. How did Simon become rock? By confessing Jesus as Messiah and Son of the living God. And after him, all who confess Jesus with the same faith also become rocks and stones like Peter. Hence, the double interpretation, rock equals Peter, and rock equals faith, are not mutually exclusive. This is the conclusion uh, presented by the two foremost Orthodox scholars in the primacy of Peter. Uh, close quote. So, here, here Father Laurent says that we don't have a necessary uh, uh, division in, in how we should interpret this. Now, obviously, he made a note about how all of us become rocks. This is not. This is actually not new. Origin uh, of Alexandria, back in the third century. He too, uh, in his commentary on Saint Matthew, says that if all of us say Christ is the Son of the Living God, we all become rocks, and we all receive the keys of the kingdom. And we all combine and lose. Um, you know, and I would say that's origin in another one of his uh, sporadic uh, interpretations. Um, but suffice it to say that Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism don't follow that to a T. Uh, we still recognize that binding and loosing has a special pertaining to the priesthood. Uh, am I right? Yes. So, 
this is not uh, the, the originist interpretation of everyone being a rock, everyone walking around with the keys, and everyone being able to bind and loose is not so uh, applied equally across the board. Anyway, that's Father Laurent. Uh, another uh, priest, uh, no, not priest, sorry, another scholar, Eastern Orthodox scholar, uh, who contributed to that of uh, that famous book, it's called The Primacy of Peter, edited by uh, Father John Meyendorf. The chapter on Peter's primacy in the New Testament and the early tradition by Vasilin Kasich. I want to quote from uh, page 65. It says, and I quote, We must conclude that the early church fathers and Christian writers recognized Peter's position of honor and preeminence in the New Testament period. He was the spokesman for the group of the twelve, the leader, the shepherd, and the martyr. Their interpretations of Jesus' promise to Peter, you are Petras, and on this Petra I will build my church, converge with those of modern exegetes. The rock is Peter. But they also interpreted the rock as Peter's confession. The church is built on Peter, or the church is built upon the rock, which is Peter's confession. We cannot find two distinct groups of exegetes, one of whom states that the rock is Peter, while the other concludes that the rock is Peter's confession. In the writings of any given author, one can often find both interpretations simultaneously. Some of these early exegetes, in fact, go much further than modern theologians and are more Catholic uh, and more liberal than they are in asserting that the rock is every disciple of Christ who confesses his master as Peter did, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Close quote. So um, those are two orthodox uh, scholars who who don't see a problem uh, interpreting the passage uh, where Peter is the rock, and that there is this convergence between the rockiness of Peter is is uh, due to his faith. I'll add this last thing. You know, Christ is all wise. The last thing that Christ is going to do, if he wants to emphasize how Simon has nothing to do with the rock of the church, if he wanted to really emphasize that Simon the man is over here and the rock, which is his faith, is all the way over here and they're two totally separate things, the last thing Christ is going to do is give Simon the name rock. I, 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 I have continuously uh, tried to reason how, why would uh, why would Jesus rename him if he had no intention of converging the concepts, even if the principal agent was faith, and even if the principal agent being faith comes from Christ, the solid rock, uh, ultimately. So I, I think we, we I think there's good reason to say that um, we we don't have uh, it's overplayed. I, I would say this idea that there's a d- difference and the Catholics have had it wrong. Now, the question becomes, and we'll be getting into this as the podcasts uh, uh, continue to grow, is what does that mean now? Okay, Peter's the the rock. Does that now mean this infallible, perpetual, uh, permanent, invincible, petrine line of infallible teachers? Well, we're going to have to see that. Um, And we'll test the merits of Welton's... Uh, research on that question but suffice to say that's what we got for now now the next thing I wanted to move on to was he quoted a famous canon from the early years Uh, it comes from I believe the Council of Antioch in 341 he quotes a canon Uh, let me just get to the page here it says um the bishops of every nation must acknowledge him who is first among them and account him as their head 
and do nothing of consequence without his consent. But each may do those things which concern his own parish and the country places which belong to it. But neither let him who is first do anything without the consent of all. For so there will be oneness of mind, and God will be glorified through the Lord in the Holy Spirit. Close quote. This is Apostolic Canon 34. I noticed this is often quoted too in my exchanges with uh, my uh, Orthodox friends, uh, friendly and non-friendly. <laughs> um, the, the only thing I want to touch on here with, this, with regard to this canon is in the beginning the bishops of every nation the Greek there is ethnos and in the original context this was referring to uh, I believe it's the province of the churches within a province and if that's the case the canon pertains to metropolitan primacy okay we don't even have patriarchal primacy in view here by this time that would be quite anachronistic I think I mean, somebody could argue that the uh, you know the Canon Six from uh, Nicaea uh, gives a sort of quasi patriarchal primacy to the Bishop of Alexandria and the Bishop of a uh, Bishop of Antioch, um, but but I think we're I think we're speaking anachronistically for many reasons, and I'll go into this more in the pod podcast later. But this canon is really talking about metropolitan primacy. And metropolitan primacy is not the same thing as the one single universal Petrine primacy. Uh, they exist uh, in analogy. There's anal there's an, they, they exercise an analogy, but the prerogatives are not the same. Now, having said that, we know in, in papal teaching, the papal claims of Vatican I, many of my listeners will know, and if you don't know, you could read the Council of Vatican, 1870, and it teaches quite clearly that the Pope has a supreme authority in the universal church, uh, particularly when it comes to doctrine, and that uh, dogmatic teaching, infallible teaching, that is when he speaks invoking uh, his supreme teaching authority as the successor of Peter and when he speaks from his chair from the, the from his position of authority ex cathedra what he teaches is by itself and not by consent of the church infallible irreformable now this does not mean as it's been interpreted by many that the Pope can just invent teachings, go against the Episcopate, go against all the bishops of, you know, the French Episcopate, the English Episcopate, the Italian Episcopate, and just go against everybody and just start teaching and whatever he wants. No. No, no, no. The Council itself repeatedly said in, in, in the Acts and in the Minutes that the Pope is restricted, he's bound. In fact, he's probably the most bound. Because... The, it was said quite explicitly in the council that um, the Holy Spirit is not promised to the successors of Peter so that they might make known some new doctrine. Rather, it says in chapter 4, line 6, that the Holy Spirit gives assistance so that he might religiously guard guard and expound the revelation or the deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles once and for all. Now, I know, I know, I know. This is debated. And whether there is a continuity and who gets to say there's the continuity, I know we'll get into that. But I just want to let you know that the, the emphatic claim is that the Pope is bound. And therefore, when he takes it upon himself to teach a doctrine ex cathedra, he has to abide by what is already being believed by the episcopate. He has to, he has to, he has no choice but to look at the past 
and what the apostolic deposit is and what the scriptures are and what the sacred tradition has always taught in the ordinary magisterium what the councils have taught what the consensus of the church fathers have taught what the the scholastic, scholastic theologians have taught about a, a particular subject he has to so uh, he is taking in everything that comes before him now what we say when we mean that uh, that by itself and not by the consent of the church what that means is that once the pope comes to say this is true and delivered by the apostles we mean that it doesn't take a subsequent reception by the bishops to endow that particular formula with authority it is of itself authoritative and it doesn't need the agreement or the the ratification from the bishops after it's proclaimed in order to endow it with irreformable character that does not mean that in order to get to the point where the pope teaches that he doesn't need the uh, the the teaching of his fellow bishops and the church at large We'll get in. We'll get more into more into that as we uh, get further along. The next thing uh, I wanted to bring up uh, in this podcast is uh, so. Anyway, going back to that Apostolic Canon Thirty Four. Yeah, that's metro, metro metro political metropolitan primacy, and we have no problem with Apostolic Canon Thirty Four uh, in the history of the Church. It was gladly accepted by the most uh, ardent papalist popes, like Pope Saint Leo. He he was a strong defender of the metropolitical primacy. All right. Um, the next thing that Welton brings up is that the church is Episcopal, not papal, Episcopal. And he and he uh, touches on something that today is is divided in uh, in the dialogue between the, the the Orthodox and the Catholics on the notion of universalist ecclesiology versus the local principal ecclesiology uh, the for the, the latter is you know coming from the patristic uh, quotes from Saint Irenaeus uh, Saint Cyprian and Saint Ignatius of Antioch that the, the bishop is in the church and the church is in the bishop so if you have a valid bishop you have the fullness of the church you have the altar you have you have the episcopate you have the sacramental life you have everything right there in in this um, holographic fullness in a local uh, a local spot so if that's the case then each bishop is fully sufficient and doesn't need any external that is external from the local uh, to validate it now they wouldn't go that far the Eastern Orthodox won't go that far to say that there's com- there's no uh, criteria outside or external to a local principle, they would say that that the, the criteria that exists out there is the agreement of all the bishops would be the criteria for each bishop validly reigning as a bishop. Now, um, he quotes, Welton quotes on page 21 of his book, he quotes St. Jerome, who was a priest in Rome. He quotes Jerome from uh, a letter to Evangelus. Okay, he quotes the following and I'm going to I'm going to read what he what he quotes here. It is not the case that there is one church at Rome and another in all the world beside. Gaul and Britain, Africa and Persia, India and the East worship one Christ and observe one rule of truth. If you ask for authority, the world outweighs its capital. Wherever there is a bishop, whether it be at Rome or at Angubium, whether it be at Constantinople or at Regium, whether it be at Alexandria or Zoan, his dignity, the bishop, is one, and his priesthood is one. Neither the command of wealth nor the lowliness of poverty makes him more a bishop or less a bishop, all alike our successors to the apostles. Close quote. So, uh, Welton sees the Roman Catholic idea 
in diametric opposition. Now, the reason why he does that is because he doesn't understand the, the, the distinction that Catholics make between order and jurisdiction. The Bishop of Rome is a bishop, just like the Bishop of Gaul or the Bishop uh, of Carthage or at the time the Bishop of uh, Alexandria, the Bishop, bishop of Antioch, uh, Bishop of Caesarea. They all share in the same priesthood. It's not as if the Eucharistic sacrifice is bigger and better in Rome than it is in Gaul or Britain. It is not as if the absolving hand of the of the Pope is more absolving than other bishops or other priests. Um, the bishop is one, the altar is one, the same Christ is offered up on it. So, on the level of order, all bishops, including the Pope, is equal in dignity and, we could say, even in power, because uh, the sacraments, the seven sacraments, uh, they are uh, held by the fullness of the order, which is held in each bishop. Now, we're going to go into something here in St. Jerome that will prove that some explanation is required. Because when St. Jerome made his way to the east, into Palestine, he had encountered uh, many bishops, many bishops, who were quite deviant to what he understood as correct Nicene Christology. And he, he didn't quite know where to go for Holy Mass. So he wrote a famous letter to Pope Damasus. Damasus. This is this is going back to 375 AD. In this letter, the same author who just told us that the bishop everywhere is the same is going to tell us something distinctive and peculiar, unique, about the Bishop of Rome. I read to you. Since the East dashed against itself by the accustomed fury of its peoples, is tearing piecemeal and undivided, the undivided tunic of Christ, woven from the top throughout, and foxes are destroying the very vine of Christ, so that among the broken cisterns, which have no water, it is hard to locate the sealed fountain and the enclosed garden. I have considered, therefore, that I ought to consult the chair of Peter and the faith praised by the mouth of the apostles. From the priest I ask the salvation of the victim, from the shepherd the safety of the sheep. Away with envy, the canvassing of the Roman height recedes, I speak with the successor of the fisherman, with the disciple of the cross, following no one in the first place but Christ. I am in communion with your beatitude, that is, with the chair of Peter. For on that rock I know the church is built. Whoever shall eat outside this house is profane. If any be not with Noah in the ark, he shall perish in the flood. And because for my sins I have migrated to this solicitude, where Syria borders on the barbarians, and I cannot always at this great distance ask for the Holy One of the Lord, that is the Eucharist, from your holiness, therefore I follow here those who are in communion with you, the Egyptian confessors, and under these great ships my little vessel lies hid. Close quote. So, that's letter 15. I'll have it linked. Uh, St. Jerome makes it clear that the episcopate has a criteria. Um, obviously it has, has uh, more than one, but the, the criteria that is is uh, quite explicit here 
is that the chair of Peter, which really Rome is, is talking about, the chair of Damasus, that's the Roman bishopric, is uh, it is the place that validates Catholic communion. And hence, he says, anyone who eats the lamb outside of this house is is eating in a profane place. Now, obviously, you know, those of you who are thinking... Uh, you know, are thinking in terms of the Eastern Orthodox sacraments are valid, etc., etc. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now, St. Jerome's not speaking to this here. He is speaking to the issue of what is the full church. He doesn't want to be in schism, in other words. And the, the schism would be that which is broken away from Peter's chair. So, we already have we already have some, some somewhat of a springboard, you could say, uh, to take what he said before, where all bishops are one, like Cyprian said, all bishops are one, all all res- rest on the rock of Peter, all all sit on the one episcopate, and all have their share in it. Um, he could say that, but at the same time, he knows that there's this originating function in Peter's chair, the physical one, the the one that su- that has the succession from Peter in Rome. So there's that distinction between the equality of order and the distinction of jurisdiction and uh, and the attribute of being the principle of unity. So we'll get more into that. Um, but th- that's that's going to end this podcast. So I just want to close up uh, saying something briefly here and uh, I'll let you guys go. Um I really sympathize with Welton and his critiques on the liturgical collapse of the Catholic Church. I myself attend a uh, the Anglican Ordinariate. It's an Anglican Ordinary Parish uh, of the Chair of Saint Peter, and our our Mass is a very reverent Mass at Orientum. There are some Latin in there. It's very very close to the to the Tridentine form, um, although uh, now we have lay people re- that are reading, but that's because we don't have an official deacon yet or uh, another uh, accompanying priest. So I, I am, I'm glad, and I thank God that I am in the situation I am in, and I feel for those who might be listening and who are out there who are in a parish that is. Um, you know, aberration. There's so much aberra- aberrations from the faith. Uh, I, you have my uh, condolence. I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry that Welton went through what he did. But the fact of the matter is this: we have this one visible true church doctrine, and whatever the true church is, we know that the storms of hell will not prevail. The storms of hell will not prevail. And, in fact, it, it is at this time where the Catholic Church is taking blow after blow that we're really going to test this out. We're really going to see uh, whether that's true. Uh, but from but from a research point of view, a theological point of view, we've got this one visible true church doctrine that has attached to it this the necessity of continuity. Historical, theological, liturgical, etc., cultic, uh, you name it. And there has to be a good reason to suggest that the Catholic Church has departed in faith. I gave in this podcast uh, a few reasons. We could have gone through more. Why it is that the common objection of Peter not being the rock, rather it's his faith, does not amount to a substantial critique which would invalidate the Catholic doctrine. Uh, we, we also saw that you know Apostolic Canon 35 widely widely uh, uh, quoted to invalidate the Catholic notion of primacy. It doesn't match a falsifying critique. doesn't amount to that because originally the ethnos was referring to uh, the 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 metropolitical context um, we also saw that 
uh, the the, uh, the, Epis- the episcopalism of the church does not mean that there is no universal criteria residing in a single bishop, which Saint Jerome made abundantly clear in the fourth century. My th- my takeaway from his first chapter is this: we shouldn't see anything akin to a post schismatic, uh, a post Rome. Um, uh, primacy. We shouldn't be hearing Saint Jerome talk about the chair of Peter. We shouldn't, you know, especially pertaining to Pope Damasus himself, who made very, very strong uh, the papal claims. We could have gone into that, um, but we're we really looking for continuity here. And and you know, me as a Roman Catholic who who had desires to go into the Eastern Orthodox Church a while back, and continues to poke my head into the discussions quite often here. We shouldn't be seeing uh, this idea of a Petrine succession coming from Jerome or Augustine or Cyprian or any of these fathers. We should see something much more clearer in regard to an unequa Episcopalianism. Uh, something clearly showing that the patriarchal organization is simply a matter of what uh, Dr. F- Father Franz Dvornik said was the principle of accommodation but we we see much more than that we see much more than that and and we'll get into this in more of the podcast to come but suffice it to say for now we have a divergence in viewpoint in many of the writers who exist in the first millennium and therefore not everyone is unanimous and so it is sort of a a hunt or an investigation to find what's opinion, theologumina, what is dogma, what is accepted as the faith. Uh, You can't just point to one quote or the the next and try to claim victory. It's not going to work. We have to look at arguments and and what's likely. We we do need to appeal to to, um, uh, probability, in other words. And Welton here makes it out to be much more simplistic than it is, as we've shown. All right, you guys, uh, you guys have a blessed day, and pray for me and my family. Um, I am uh, trying to do these podcasts uh, at least now once a week. I'll start. Uh, please pray that God gives me the wisdom uh, to know the truth and to communicate it effectively. God bless you all.